motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome back to episode 65 of the School for Mothers podcast. I'm Danusha Melina Durban, your host, and the title for this week's episode is Wild. And my special guest is Annabelle Thomas. Now, Annabelle is the founder and CEO of Nooknean, an organic whiskey distillery on the west coast of Scotland. Annabelle set up Nooknean in an effort to challenge the existing norms of scotch as an elitist, stuffy old man's drink. Previously, Annabelle was a management consultant in London, where she still lives with her husband and two-year-old daughter, whilst commuting regularly to Scotland. I'm really looking forward to speaking with Annabelle because the spirit, excuse the awful pun, of her company is just so school for mothers. Before we dive in, I want to read a part of her website that I particularly love. Nagnean is an abbreviation of the Queen of Spirits in Gaelic legend. She was a huntress, strong, independent and never afraid to walk her own path. A quiet rebel. Oh, isn't that just perfect? Mm, Let's dive into my conversation then with Annabelle on Wild. I've never had a whiskey in my life. I mean, it's fair to say I'm not a whiskey drinker. But when I saw about Annabelle Thomas's work and how she's created this distillery, I can hardly say it. Listeners, you're used to me, I, I know. But how she created this, I had to ask Annabelle onto this podcast and um, welcome, Annabelle. I'm so thrilled that we're going to have this conversation about wild. Thank you very much. Yeah, so it is pretty unusual, isn't it? To Is it unusual to be a woman, a female whiskey drinker? Or isn't it? Well, that's a very good question. It's definitely perceived to be unusual. But actually... Mm. The more time I spend in the whiskey industry, the more it's not as unusual as people think. There are actually quite a lot of women out there who drink whiskey and who work in the industry. It continues to be perceived very much as a both a man's drink and a man's world. Why do you think that is? What what's what's given that perception? Because clearly, I I believe it. Now I don't. <laughs> I think it's a really long history. I think it was traditionally a man's world in terms of the industry before we had helpful tractors and forklift trucks and things. It was actually a very, very physical job. So I think from the point of view of people mm-hmm. working in the industry, there was it was very male dominated. The whole drinking thing, I think if you look back over many decades, it was perceived as not very ladylike to drink hard spirits, neat spirits. And I think therefore that combined with this stupid perception that you can only drink scotch neat, maybe has those two things have come together to, I don't know, make people think that women don't drink it. But it's it's a bit ridiculous, really. Well, it is a bit ridiculous. It's fascinating, isn't it? That the, the idea of not being ladylike has kind of really been an obstacle and continues to be an obstacle for so many women. So so I much know, society. In 2020. <laughs> yeah, in 2020 we are we are still navigating and grappling with what does it mean to be ladylike? Lady, I mean, for the love of God, I mean, you know, <laughs> ladylike. I I don't know about you, but do you wake <laughs> up thinking, how can I be ladylike today? <laughs> No, I do occasionally <laughs> think, oh dear, I'm never very ladylike. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, if I put on an outfit that uh, I, I do have one particular outfit, actually, that I think, oh, this is terribly demure and ladylike. <laughs> and I, I actually talked about it with Sally Smy for our Christmas styling episode, actually. And it was, and, and it's true, I do feel ladylike in it, but I have to almost have to have that voice as well. I'm very ladylike and I, I go a little bit breathy yes, exactly. and that's the whole point and it's the antithesis of scotch isn't it yes exactly exactly 
I'm going to ask a really stupid question, but I believe in those. No stupid so questions. With, how, you know, because I really want to be of service to you. Because if I don't understand this, maybe somebody else doesn't. So forgive. Scotch yes. whiskey. Scotch and whiskey. Like I've just told you, I've never had a whiskey in my life. Actually, I think I had a sip in a in an office's mess. But, um, you know, that's another story. What's scotch and whiskey? I mean, come on. I mean, I'm obviously asking. Well, are they the same thing? Whiskey is... Whiskey can be made in lots of different places. It can be made in Scotland. It can be made in England. It can be made in America. It can be made in Ireland. And it can be made anywhere. Scotch is yep. just any whiskey that's made in Scotland. There are right. very strict rules about how you can make it and what it can be made from and all those things, just like there are also very strict rules about where, you, where and how you can make Stilson the cheese or any, anything else like that. And so Scotch just means a whiskey made in Scotland. It's that simple. Brilliant. Now that's, oh, I'm so glad I asked actually. That's good. Got it. Really got it. I actually don't like the word scotch very much because I feel like that is the most heavily associated word with kind of all of the old school, inaccessible, stuffy traditions of Scottish whiskey. I don't know whether that's just my perception, but I actually find that kind of almost sums up all the things the whiskey industry in Scotland needs to move away from. Oh, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I just see, it just gives me a very masculine feel. And it's not that I think of, you know, Scots as male. I don't. It's the word Scotch just brings me to, and I'm not problematizing masculinity, but when we're talking about, about the history that has been an obstacle for women in that industry, then yes, it, it just feels male. It just feels, but I guess it's just yeah. because um, my perception was so embedded in the false idea, that false perception that actually it's only men that drink and are in that industry. So, but how, however did you go from being a consultant? What were you being? A con I can hear children. God forbid you've got children. <laughs> can you? Yes. <laughs> yes. You can hear a two-year-old screaming around about to go swimming. <laughs> Oh, yes. we. You know, listeners, we really do have children, us, us women, don't we? So we have a two-year-old. Do you, do you have one two-year-old? One two-year-old, indeed, yes. Mm. So if my reckoning is right, did you start the distillery in 2017? Well, yes, in terms of that's when we started distilling, but actually I've been working on it since 2013. Right. So we spent a long time raising all the money that we needed and then building the actual distillery. Did you build, I mean, that's silly, but you actually built a distillery on the wild west coast yes. of not, Scotland? <laughs> not all with my own hands, but yes. We developed all the plans. We got planning permission. We appointed contractors and then built it. It was a very tumble down old farm building before we started. And now we have a lovely, shiny distillery. So I got very familiar with pumps and valves and all of those things that someone probably taught me about some many moons ago, but uh, I had to relearn all over again. And I mean, you were a consultant, yeah, in London. Yes. Yeah. What kind of consultant were you? I was a strategy consultant in retail and consumer goods. So okay. did all sorts of weird and wonderful projects from looking at Salesforce effectiveness to how to merge companies together. Yeah. Was this originally a side hustle, a hobby, an interest? Um, it was originally a family idea is where right. it came from. So it's on my parents' farm. It was an idea that we'd kind of been throwing around within the family for a few years. Mm -hmm. I then took a sabbatical from my job as a strategy consultant because I wanted a bit of time out and they were very generous at giving sabbaticals. And so I took them up on the opportunity and I said to my family, well, why don't I try writing the business, proper business plan for this thing we've been talking about forever while I'm on sabbatical because I have some time. Mm, how exciting. It was. It was great, actually. Yeah. What a really wonderful family enterprise, you know, like a focus. It's really funny. Over Christmas time, my family often comes up with with uh, not particularly wacky 
ideas, but it feels sometimes like bold ideas that maybe we could do. And some of them we've actually done, you know, some oh, of them cool. we've, yeah, and, and, and some we haven't. And it, those things kind of get repeated the next year of, oh, yes, we were thinking of doing that, weren't we? You know, that kind of yes. ongoing conversation about a project or an adventure that wouldn't it be great if we got a bus and we all went across America or something <laughs> like that or South America. And, and then, of course, you go back into your lives in January and you think, oh, yes, mm, OK. <laughs> and it resurrects the next Christmas. <laughs> so but uh, so I'm. The reason I mention it is because, as you say, that kind of family wanting to do this, that this conversation that goes on, but you actually made it, you you made it real, which is fantastic. I mean, I'm not surprised now that it took so long. Yeah, It's not exactly. actually very long. It really, that's not very long at all. It felt like a long time at the time. But now looking back on it, yes, it doesn't feel very long. The problem is we went into it with completely unrealistic expectations as to how long it would all take. Um, which meant that at the time it, it felt like it was taking forever. But um, yes, but now you know better. Along exactly, that. exactly. Yeah. Now we know much better. Yeah, exactly. So, so on your family, family property, yeah, family farm. Correct. So, was it always going to be a distillery? Was that what you were talking about? Yes, it was always going to be a distillery. Although that hadn't, my parents bought the farm. 15 or so years ago and the distillery was nowhere there was no idea for a distillery then it kind of came I, can't, I don't we don't know exactly when it first arrived the idea first arrived but mm. yes it was and I guess I think when you're in Scotland whiskey is such a you know it's at the forefront of what you're thinking about it you know there's whiskey distilleries everywhere and so I guess it it kind of seems obvious when you're there to do scotch whiskey somehow and it's also kind of a practical thing to make as well because Scotch whiskey grew up or developed being made on farms and it's a very natural process. So all of the spent grain is eaten by the cows on the farm and things. So it's a very circular process mm -hmm. and that, that, really, um, that really makes it an easy thing to do. Yeah, so obvious, easy, ecologically, like, I mean, just just is the most practical thing to do, and exactly. and and embedded in the identity, I guess, of being in Scotland in some it, ways. It, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Hmm. And so that was always the idea. We had lots of different versions of it at different times, as you would expect. Hmm. But yeah, whiskey was always pretty central to it. It's almost it feels like a magical story, to be honest. I think there's something about whiskey and Scotland that is very romantic still. Yes, yes. Although I think during the building project in the middle of winter, it didn't necessarily feel magical all of the time. <laughs> well, no, no, exactly. That, that I would imagine that that really was a wild time. And I'm wondering what the the wildness of going on this pseudo romantic magical story what that wildness has been like for you and especially as now you're a mother I mean the reason I mentioned 2017 was because you've got a two-year-old and I was doing the maths thinking hmm yeah <laughs> yes you've had a very young child during this explosion of this this business I mean I really mean in a good way my explosion you know this this emergence of of your business what has it been like for me? Um, I think it would be fair to say it's definitely been a roller coaster. It's mostly been wonderful. <laughs> the The hardest bit was the very the very earliest bit back in twenty fourteen. So I left my mm -hmm. I left Bain in twenty thirteen, and the, the fundraising bit was hard because you never know if you're actually going to get there. If you don't raise the money, you can't build the distillery. And until you've raised the money, you don't know that you've raised the money. It could, you know, you need to fill your whole book with investors. And that was, that I found psychologically extremely difficult. Yes. The build period was very stressful because all buildings are. We were, use, we were adapting an old building, which is kind of the very worst thing you can do. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. And... You know, it was quite complicated and there's lots of bits of equipment to fit into an old building and so on. 
since 2017, when we started distilling, it's changed. The whole thing for me has changed drastically because I've gone from basically doing it on my own without a team, which is where we were in the build phase, for example, to having a team of five and now six in Scotland. And it's, it's kind of growing all the time. And that has been much more enjoyable, having more people around, sharing the experience with more people, and also being able to start sort of talking about what we're trying to do and things to the wider world. So it's been, I found it much more rewarding in the last few years than I did in the first, in the first couple. Yeah, I've got lots of questions um, from what you've just said, because th- there is something inherently very lonely about that, that raising investment time. Yes. As well as the building, yes. I, I can hear very isolating. Exactly. Um, how, how did you lean in, or who did you lean into? I think different people at different points. Probably, it's always the investment raising in particular was a very collaborative experience with my father, who's still very involved in the business. He's one of the directors, and I, I mean, there's no way I could have done it on my own without his help. Partly because he had much better people to go and ask for money than I did. <laughs> Yeah, That's quite important. Yeah. How much did you raise? We raised uh, nearly five million of equity and mm-hmm. a couple of million of bank debt and some government grants, which were about six hundred thousand. Yeah, so not in substantial amounts. No, not in substantial amounts, and also off a bit of paper, as it were. We didn't really have anything to show for it, which was tricky because a lot of businesses would have a prototype or you know a something yes. whereas we didn't because until you've built the distillery you can't make the whiskey so that definitely that made it a bit tricky well it is tricky so how i'm i'm curious about what was it that you were able to leverage in terms of because you didn't have the whiskey and um, presumably i mean you didn't have the experience the background in that industry so what were you leveraging I think we set out a clear vision of what we want to do differently. I think that's mm. important whenever you raise money or you know, it's probably important for any business, to be honest. Mm. And I think people bought into the fact that there was an opportunity for whiskey made in Scotland to, you know, move with the times. And there was an opening for a sustainable and, you know, more creative approach. And I think they believed that we could do that. We also have a very strong board with great experience from the industry. With it. And I think that mm, yes. really helps give investors reassurance that it wasn't just me riding off into the sunset with a crazy idea and that there were some people around me who had some relevant experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, that combination is fantastic, though, isn't it? Because uh, actually, I'll just cut to the, more to the chase because I'm stumbling around. I know that it's to do with made by nature, not by rules. Is that the clue in the moving with the times, your tagline? Yeah, exactly. And I suppose when I think about moving with the times, there's really two elements to that. Mm-hmm. One is the sustainability side of what we do. I think that's now completely essential for any business in the modern world to be doing is to think about how they can be reducing their carbon footprint and improving biodiversity and all of those great things. And the made by nature part of that phrase refers to that. So we only make organic products, we only use renewable energy, we recycle all of our waste to the land. Um, Sustainability is really at the core of how we've designed the whole distillery and how we operate it. Mm. And the not by rules is a bit broader. Part of it's about how whiskey should or shouldn't be drunk. <laughs> so there are a lot of rules around, of perceived rules around how in particular Scotch whiskey should be drunk and it shouldn't be mixed and blah, blah, blah. And it reminds me a little bit of the trouble French wine got itself into in the 70s when it was so complicated that people and then American wine came along and there's red and there's white and people are suddenly like oh wow well I can choose between red and white but I can't choose between left and right bank Bordeaux in 1979 and 74 and yeah it's too complex it's way too complex you need a degree Mm. to even you know have a tipple um, I mean it's ridiculous yeah Mm -hmm. and I think scotch has got itself a little bit into that problem uh, both because it's made itself complicated and because of this idea that you can only drink it neat so part of what we're trying to do is kind of say, well, there aren't any rules about how you drink it, have it in a cocktail, have it with with soda water, have it. We're also applying that same philosophy to how we make the whiskey. And we get very geeky about things like yeast and all of the flavors that creates in the whiskey that we make. And there's not that many other distilleries in Scotland thinking about things like yeast. Ah. 
which again is just, uh, I think that's the advantage of coming into an industry not knowing very much about it. I know that brewers really care about yeast. And so you look at the whiskey industry and we use yeast in the same way as brewers do. And you think, well, why, why are people only using one yeast? Let's try using other yeasts and see what flavors it creates. Well, it really sounds to me like you're demonstrating the whole idea of diversity at- in business, that when when we are when we are you know going with the very straight traditional old school model, whether that's the the actual model itself or the people that have that model in their head, then we stick with that. Whereas when we broaden it and we and we do turn it upside down and and bring people in who have such different perspectives because of their life experience. So because you've come into this completely different, you know, with a different worldview in a way, you you can think, well, why are we why are we using just that beast? Why why do we do it that way? You know Absolutely. And they say on boards, you know, when when they are when they're populated, because obviously that's actually in my my career. So, you know, when when we work with boards, it's it's that whole idea of well you know, bringing them in, they will have such very, very different um, perspectives. And we've got to have that. We have to, because otherwise we just keep replicating the same old shit, basically. Absolutely. <laughs> Cutting Absolutely. To it. I completely <laughs> agree. And it's, it's complete. So I think as a business now, we have a very diverse team. Mm-hmm. Um, there are actually more women than men in the business overall. Mm-hmm. And only one of my team of six now has come from a whiskey background. And I wow. think you're, it, I see in practice every day exactly what you've described, which is people just think about it in a completely different way as a result. Think yeah. about any problem they're presented with, you know, it doesn't have to be directly whiskey related, but. Exactly. So you pull on that worldview and experience and, and solve problems and innov- you know innovate from that place and and so it's i, c- I can imagine why you are you know, looking as you called it geekily at you know that c- various components not just the actual way that you drink whiskey but the how whiskey's made and who drinks it why exactly. don't you drink it you know so it's it feels like a bit of a feminist you know it's a feminist drink um in some ways, yes. Although I also don't, I don't want to make it too much about women because no, no I almost can feel like that's too much in the other direction. You know, mm-hmm. it's been all about men, and it shouldn't. they just shouldn't all be about a women. Gender element to it, almost. It's like, well, anyone can drink it; it doesn't matter. Yes, yeah, yeah. I I get that. It's funny though, isn't it? When we redress the balance, we get swing. Sometimes we can swing just that bit too much over yes. in order to recalibrate. <laughs> yes, so, indeed. Yeah, indeed. I, I thought, as I said, it was like, yeah, I'm placing feminist in in this in this conversation, and in some ways, it's not it's not relevant. In others, well, why not? You know, to, to even think about feminism and alcohol, uh, not I mean, the most obvious thing I think about feminism and alcohol is is the whole idea of women and rape, for instance, and yeah. you know, alcohol constantly comes up in litigation, doesn't it? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, when else do we talk about, well, what do women drink? We, 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 we drink Prosecco, we drink champagne, we drink a lot. I mean, we drink beers, we drink all sorts of things. We drink spirits. I know that. But it is interesting how this has been a very masculine, you know, that drink and, and dominated by men in, in it. And I love the fact that you're, you know, I mean, goodness, more women. How, how many men do you have then? We yeah, have two men and four women of my team of six plus me. So, um, mm. which is not intentional either. It's not like we go out to only recruit women. It's just they've been the right people for the roles when they've come up. Fascinating. But it's great. But I, I mean, it's not really a but. It's an and. I mean, it's really, really thrilled to see that you offer internships. So. Yeah. Say a bit about your internships because this sounds, oh, it just sounds really soul uh, kind of nourishing and, and <laughs> thrilling from a, no, I mean, seriously thrilling from a knowledge perspective. Yeah, so it was, um, well, we've only done it once so far. So we did it for the first mm-hmm. time last year. And the idea came from lots of different places, I guess. It was partly what we've already talked about, which is 
there aren't as many women as men in the industry overall. It was partly an understanding that a lot of grads, so there's a great brewing and distilling university in Edinburgh, for example, and a lot of the grads coming out of that, the women were less inclined to consider going into whiskey than they were into gin distilling or brewing or anything else. Mm -hmm. And just a desire to kind of break down those barriers a bit and say, you know, look, we've got lots of women working here. Whiskey making is not about heaving one ton sacks of barley around. It is just as open to women as it is to men. And so we thought, well, why don't we offer an internship for women uh, to come work in the distillery for a week and then they can actually see what it's like. And we tried to do as much kind of of everything for them in that week as we could. So they'd see the foraging that we do for our botanical spirit. They'd see all of the whiskey making elements. They'd see the maturation. They'd see the blending and the whole thing in, in a week. And it was great. We're still in touch with our two interns. I think they got absolutely loads out of it. One of them's actively considering moving into the industry, which is amazing. Wow. And I think the other thing which I hadn't expected as much, but was a brilliant kind of bonus was that we got, um, I hope it helped the women who heard about it or applied for it, but didn't get to come on it to think about the industry in a different way anyway, even if they didn't experience the internship. So I hope it had a wider impact than just the two women who actually, you know, who actually came on the internship. Yeah, isn't it an eye opener? I mean, it's it's not only a brand awareness, you know, it's great that people would know what you were up to if they didn't already. But I mean, just, yeah, I mean, eye opening about the the possibility exactly. to, to work in this area rather than, and that's part of it, isn't it? That the, we, we get tunnel vision about what's possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And just saying to people that, you know, this this is possible for you is is sometimes all that's needed. Well, it's it's part of the mission behind the School for Mothers podcast that we get this kind of tricky, very relatively narrow kind of perception about what's possible once you're a mother or for women and then once you're a mother. And so that's why we have these conversations with women doing all sorts of things. We don't actually actively go out and find, oh, let's find a firefighter. Let's find. We don't do that. We come across women or women come to us and, and their stories, their very varied stories, expose our listeners to just what you're doing, which is saying, whiskey, consider whiskey. Yeah. You know, consider whiskey as you drink. Consider, exactly. it, consider mixing it with whatever the hell you fancy you know, try it out. How about it as an industry? Maybe they've got a daughter or a son. It's it's not, you know, it's not exactly. just, it, it's it's so much more than listening to that or, or witnessing that narrative that is just so, just so very, yeah, small. Narrow, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's narrow. It just is really narrow. And, and so that's why it's thrilling. So, but you live in London, yeah? I do, yes. I live in how, London. How do you navigate this um, being with the distillery, running the distillery and being in London? Um, being a mom? Well, I, I travel a lot. So I try <laughs> to go up to the distillery every third week, uh-huh. which is to support the team. And also it's just always people I need to meet up there or show around or, or you know, those sorts of things. We have a wonderful nanny who looks after our daughter, who is totally essential to the whole equation, um, because I yes. definitely wouldn't be running the distillery otherwise. Mm. But when mm. I am in London, I get to work from home, which I find is quite a nice balance to the travel that I have to do. And increasingly now we're selling more. It used to be I'm tra- I was traveling constantly to the distillery when we're getting that up and running, but now the team there are great and doing things under their own steam. But there's now whiskey fairs that I have to go to in the Netherlands or Germany and so yes but I find that working from home when I am in London is the is a good enough balance for me to to balance out the to balance out the travel do you have other mothers in your your team yes I we do of the four ladies in my team two are mothers and two are not Mm. but both of the other ladies have more grown-up children than I do yes Yes, because it, it it has emerged well while you've had your little girl, hasn't it? So Yes, indeed. And in fact, I think basically as soon as we started distilling whiskey, I was pregnant, which was a very frustrating 
period to just be starting to make alcohol when I suddenly couldn't drink it for nine months. Mm, yeah. But yes, I basically got pregnant at the beginning of 2017 and then Emilia was born towards the end of 2017, took a bit of time off at the beginning of 2018, which worked well timing wise. You know, the distillery was yes. going under its own steam and there were a couple of projects we had on, but we could press pause on them a little bit whilst I took some time off. So, yeah. How did you how did you manage with not tasting whiskey? I mean, as a I don't mean as a drinker of whiskey. I mean for the business. How did you manage with that? As in, when I was pregnant. Yes. Yes. Oh, I just tasted it anyway and spat it out, or didn't taste very much. <laughs> yeah. Did your Did your palate change while you were pregnant? Well, I don't know. I don't think it did. I didn't notice mm-hmm. it did, but I think it's right. one of those things that's very hard to measure. You can kind of it dream is, up it? that maybe it has, and then you're not really very sure about it. So, yeah, yeah, I wonder. Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's another it's another case of doing the hell what you want, really, isn't it? And, yeah, and, and exactly. there are, there are some. It, it relates to the whole things about rules. Because there are so many rules for pregnant women and I'm not, I am definitely a million percent not advocating drinking oodles of buckets of alcohol while pregnant listeners, I'm not. <laughs> but actually, you know, we do get to choose whether we had, you know, what, what we do. And for instance, when I was having the triplets, Annabelle, um, my last pregnancy, my consultant, my obstetrician actually yeah. suggested that I had some alcohol. I'm really? not talking when Yeah, I'm not talking I'm not talking when I was early pregnant. Yes, I yes. was talking about oh, I think from I mean I delivered at twenty eight weeks, so from twenty two, twenty three. So it was for a few weeks and she just said, Look, Danusha, I know that, you know, all my advice is don't have a drink. She said, In your case, have a drink. Uh, <laughs> have a drink. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I really suggest. While you're on this bed rest, I suggest you have a tipple a day. Yeah. <laughs> and and I did. I, I had yeah. one French bottle of beer a day, and I'm not a beer drinker. But I suddenly thought, hmm, that's what I fancy. I really I fancy. want. <laughs> yes, and I'm damn it, I'm having three of them. I'm having my beer, and I would, I relish that one little beer. Yeah. And so I can, I can understand that. I mean, it's part of your, it's your business, it's your profession. So you, <laughs> how would you give that up? Which is exactly. Why I, Although you know, also, I guess at the at the beginning there was not. If I was pregnant now, it would be more problematic because we're actually trying to design the whiskey we're going to release. And that involves actually quite a lot of tasting. <laughs> it's yes. a hard life. Um, although <laughs> but, but at the beginning, we were really just making spirit and putting it into barrels and leaving it to go to sleep in the warehouse. Yes. So in terms yeah. of the necessity to taste a lot, there actually wasn't. We needed to make sure that the spirit that we were making was really, really good. And that was kind of it so yes you're um, at a very different stage now aren't you exactly, so exactly yes oh this is very i mean this is this is for me um very much a world that i'm not in and i would really love to come and see the distillery by the way <sighs> i want to come i love scotland and wasn't in scottish terms i'm sure not that far from you a while ago and so I wish I'd known you then. I would have actually. Yes, yeah. exactly. Well, do come and visit. It's, it's not that easy to get to, but it's worth the journey. Well, yes, exactly. And so where will we find, where will we find your whiskey? Is it everywhere and anywhere? Well, at the moment, nowhere, because we haven't released it yet. It is still, it has to be one of the rules about what whiskey from Scotland has to be, is that it has to be three mm. years old. Okay. So in March of this year, we will officially hit that three-year date, although it will be a good few months after that that we release a whiskey. Okay. So it will be coming out in the summer, and we you will find it in bars and specialist retailers, basically, in the UK and hopefully also abroad. Okay, so summer 2020 is exactly. a massive point for you isn't it a massive it oh how when we started wonderful. distilling 2020 sounded like some kind of futuristic time yes. that would never arrive and here we are it's january 2020 uh congratulations on this epic journey it's groundbreaking in so many ways actually isn't it and and gosh, i can't say anything other than congratulations and thank you so much for having this conversation and opening our eyes to possibilities that honestly we i know for myself and listeners yeah I yeah that's <laughs> just like wow <laughs> thank you thank you well thank you for having me on it's been lovely to chat 
Yeah, thank you and good luck. I'm sure that um, we'll be in touch in the summer so that we can uh, taste some. Yes. And no doubt. That's the most important bit. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you, Annabelle. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks so much for joining me on the show, Annabelle. I am super struck by the patience and resilience that creating Nian has taken you. And it's paying off, that's for sure. What a leap of faith. Now, listeners, you can find links to McNeon in the show notes, and I hope you enjoy your tipple. Next week, I'll be joined by Taban Shoresh. Taban is a child genocide survivor and the founder of The Lotus Flower. It's a women and girls nonprofit that currently works in Kurdistan. That's northern Iraq, by the way, with survivors of conflict. Now, the charity gives vulnerable girls and women a future. It improves their economic, social and cultural chances in life and has helped more than 16,000 women and girls to date. My goodness, I'm honoured to be speaking with Taban next week. Last week, by the way, I mentioned a book giveaway of three copies of Emma Heptonstall's book, How to Be Lady Who Leaves the Ultimate Guide to Getting Divorced Ready. Now we realised that announcing winners on the podcast just really might not be the wisest idea. So we've emailed the three winners. So look out for an email from me if you entered, as you may be the lucky winner of that book. That's it, listeners, till next week. Same time, same place. Meet me here. Thank you for joining us again. Here's to you. Lots of love. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 